Hey, Maria. Hey. Why don't you grab a seat? Thanks. Yeah. How do you like our new plant here? I love this plant. It's awesome. Yeah, it's going to be, I think, a great addition to the show. It's really mm -hmm. going to boost up our ratings. And I know you're really into meditation and mm -hmm. being with nature. So I thought it would just be a, an awesome compliment. Thanks so much. Does it have a name? The name is uh, Fern. Fern. Yes, yes. Nice last name. Just uh, no, it's kind of like Madonna. It's just you know one Fern. one first name usually does enough. Actually, I'm not even sure it is a fern. Welcome to the 16th episode of Fem Junior TV, brought to you by Pivotal Tracker. I'm your host, Pornima Vijay Shankar, the founder of Femgineer. In this show, I host Innovators in Tech, and together we debunk myths and misconceptions related to building products and companies. While it's easy for us to follow a known path and create what we're told to create, that doesn't always translate to us feeling fulfilled in our careers and everyday lives. What does is pushing our creative limits but that often requires us to take a risk and that can be scary. We worry about receiving criticism, getting rejected, or just failing altogether. In today's episode, we're gonna be talking about how to manage these feelings and gain creative confidence. And to help us out, I've invited a good friend of mine, Maria Molfino. Maria is a women's leadership coach and helps women gain the creative confidence they need to lead. Maria has a master's in design from Stanford University and has worked with professionals and managers at companies like Facebook, Twitter, and IDEO. Thanks so much for joining us today, Maria. Thanks, Pornima, for having me. So you and I have been friends for a number of years, but for our audience out there, let's start by talking about why you decided to go to Stanford and get your master's in design, and then how you decided to apply your design learning to what you're doing today. Sure. I, so my whole life, I've been a good girl, you know, always followed the rules and did really well in school. Part of that, in order to do that, I had to um, value analytical and logical forms of thinking. Mm -hmm. And I devalued creativity and intuition. And part of it was just what the culture and society uh, and school systems uh, supported, right? And where that led me to is jobs I really disliked. So mm -hmm. I worked in a cubicle in Washington, D.C. doing research and felt that it was really soul-sucking and and then I was in a lab, you know, crunching data in a windowless room, all because I thought I was supposed to, or that's mm -hmm. what I should do. Um, then I had sort of a series of realizations over time, which led me to shift and want to focus more on creativity. Mm -hmm. And because that is a part of who I am. And interestingly, my father is a doctor. My mom's an artist. Mm -hmm. So it was really a return to the more feminine side of things. And I went to school, so I applied to Stanford because they had a really cool design program mm -hmm. that looked at the intersection of design and learning. And that would allow me to express more of my creativity and explore that part of myself that I felt like I had kind of suppressed or done away with. Yeah. So I uh, enrolled in the program. It was wonderful. It was one year. Uh, it was really intense. And through that process, what I would say that program gave me more than anything is creative confidence. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. And what do you think that they taught you there specifically? Mm -hmm. Well, one thing is through the design school, mm -hmm. uh, I learned something called design thinking. Okay. Which is a way of designing anything, an experience, a product, a service, but it ha it's a framework, it's mm -hmm. a process. And one of the things about design thinking is being experimental, mm. allowing yourself to make mistakes, being um, allowing for many, many ideas, not being precious about your ideas. Yes. And so that allowed me to have more creative confidence and realize, wow, school kind of, in some ways, kind of screwed me over, <laughs> right or wrong answer. Right? Yeah. And then there was an unlearning that happened through design. That's one big piece uh -huh. of the, the portion. The other is that I taught um, stress management through the medical school. Mm -hmm. And 
That's where the um, understanding of how to manage your energy, yoga, meditation is, uh, was a big part of my journey as well. And so after I graduated, I kind of combined those tools. Mm -hmm. you imagine design is a tool set, yoga, meditation right. is a tool set. And the, um, the goal or the thing I wanted to work on was women mm -hmm. and women's leadership specifically. So how can we leverage these tools like design thinking and creative competence, as well as what we learn from yoga and meditation and really support women in, in rising and empowering themselves to be better leaders. Yeah. And you had talked about how when you started your career prior to being at Stanford and prior to going for your uh, degree in design, you had mentioned that you were very analytical. Mm -hmm. And so how did creativity become important to you? Mm -hmm. And why do you think it's important to everyone else out there? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> I think creativity is the state of nature. Mm -hmm. So if you look outside or if you look at a forest, what do you see? You see regeneration. You see creativity. You see that things are constantly being born out of nothing. Right. And so nature is an example of creativity. So for me, if we are, the realization that I had is that I'm a part of nature. And when I had that realization, um, that allows that I'm naturally creative. How couldn't I be? Right. Because right? I, I am nature. So that's where the understanding of creativity came. Now, as our society, you have to understand the school system is built on the industrial revolution. Right. Right. And so what does that mean is disconnect, disconnection from nature mm -hmm. and a sort of kind of assembly line, right or wrong, yes or no, black or white kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. And so um, naturally, that's what was strengthened. Mm -hmm. And I see strengthened in a lot of both boys and girls, right. men and women. Um, women have particular challenges with this that I can go into. Sure. Um, and so I think because of that school system, we're having to shift into understanding and appreciating nature and seeing creativity as a, a part of that. So most of us in technology are creating products or services, and we know that creating is not a solo act. In fact, in one of our previous episodes, we had Maria Judice, mm -hmm. who is the VP of Experience Design at Autodesk, and she talked a lot about the importance of co-creation. Mm -hmm. But the problem I've seen when co-creating is it's very, very easy to defer your creativity to somebody else, like a boss or a teammate. And even for myself, earlier on in my career, when I was a software engineer, there would be times I'd be sitting in a meeting and I'd have an idea for how to improve a product or a process but I didn't say anything, you know, because I was always concerned about people saying like, oh, you know, what does this like junior engineer know about mm -hmm. building a product mm -hmm. or even a feature? So I held back and I, I didn't feel good about holding back, but I also wasn't sure enough to speak up. So why do you think that that happens? Why do you think that even though we're creative, we start to hold back? Mm -hmm. I think we hold back because we're afraid of making mistakes, mm -hmm. right? And part of that comes from our conditioning, our conditioning of... We can't speak up unless we know the right answer. Mm -hmm. We can't speak up unless we're 100% sure right. that what we're going to say is valuable. Where did we learn that from? I don't know. You tell me. Yeah. <laughs> school. Yeah. Right? We learned that from school. Right. You don't raise your hand unless you know the answer. Mm -hmm. You don't say. You don't just speak and right. figure out your thoughts as you speak. You have to have a good reason to speak. And so I think that kind of conditioning mm -hmm. carries over into the workplace. And so my guess is when you were a junior yeah. engineer, you yeah. were just fresh out of school, right. you may have felt more, I'm not supposed to. Right? Yeah. I'm not supposed to. So I think that's really common. Mm -hmm. And why is it then, I mean, so we don't want to take this risk because we feel like we're not supposed to until we have a formulated 100% sure thought. But are there other things, like I know we talked about in the beginning, there is criticism, rejection, failure, are all those things also wrapped into that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think the fear of being criticized and judged mm -hmm. is huge, and that comes from making mistakes. What happens when you make a mistake? You look stupid. Right. You feel embarrassed. People laugh at you. People think things of you. They have opinions, right? So I think it's kind of like a conglomerate. They come hand in hand, the fear of being rejected, the fear of being criticized, and the fear of being mistakes. They're kind of a trio. Yeah. But then how do we move past that, especially for somebody that's inexperienced? How do we move past that and then finally decide to speak up? Mm -hmm. 
I think it's really getting to know your inner critic. Yeah. Which I think you and I have talked about quite right. a bit. Um, the inner critic tends to show up mm-hmm. when we are expanding, when we're at a growth edge. So when we are going to take up more space mm-hmm. than usual or more time than usual, when we're going to become more visible, for example, um, when we're going to share a part of ourselves that maybe we haven't shared before. Sure. That's when the inner critic likes to get the loudest. So I think being able to to be aware of your inner critic and recognize when it's coming up. Mm-hmm. So know the signs of your inner critic okay. is the first step. Awareness is the first key. In fact, I would say recognizing the inner critic reduces its power on you quite a bit. Okay. Yeah. But let's say, let's just play devil's advocate, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. what's the big deal? Let's give in to our fears. Let's give in to our inner critic and just keep collecting that paycheck. You know, as creators, eh, we're just going to mm-hmm. say yes to our boss or our teammates and defer to them. So what? So what if we do that? Yeah. Well, I think most people don't even get to that stage. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, most people are not even aware their inner critic is oh. driving the boat. Okay. So I think the first step is, so if you get to the stage where sure. you say, okay, my inner critic's running the show, but I don't care. Right. I'm still going to go on. Then um, the case I might make to you is, do you really care about growing and expanding? Mm-hmm. If you want to stay stagnant and yeah. continue to play small, then don't worry about your fears. Okay. You know, or, or just, you know. Sure. But if you want to expand and grow in your creative work mm-hmm. or as an entrepreneur, as a leader, you absolutely have to learn how to relate to your fears. Okay. And this is uh, just a key distinction I want to make. I'm not talking about abolishing or eliminating fears. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about coming into relationship with fear. Yeah. Which is, I think, a key part of the creative process. Okay. So let's dig into that. Let's start with those those three fears and let's start with the first the fear of criticism Mm -hmm. right and this is multifaceted because there is the criticism of ourselves Mm -hmm. which probably originates from the inner critic but also Mm -hmm. the very visible criticism of others our teammate our bosses etc let's start with the first the self-criticism how can we handle the Mm self-criticism yeah I deal with self-criticism every day. <laughs> yeah, I wake up in the morning, look at myself in the mirror. Hey, you. Yeah. <laughs> this isn't right. This isn't right, yeah. right? So I think it's an ongoing process is one thing to be aware. First of all, you're not alone. The yep. second is it's an ongoing process. It doesn't really go away. Um, the So I think what I was alluding to before about the inner critic, mm-hmm. being able to recognize when the self-criticism is emerging okay. is the first step. So recognizing the signs of self-criticism. Okay. The second is having self-compassion. Yes. Which is a lifelong journey. And I think there are specific tools and techniques for Mm self-compassion that are really wonderful that I still use. In fact, I used this morning. I wrote myself a lovely, I wrote my inner critic a lovely thank you letter. And it was, it was really powerful because one, I externalized my feelings. Mm -hmm. And two, I was able to reframe a lot of the negativity into positivity. I was able to transform that emotion. Okay. What was the example? Like what what caused the inner critic to knock on your door this morning? Well, I think um, we talked about when you're at a growth edge, yeah. when you're about to be seen. Okay. When you're about to share a part of yourself. So you knew you were going to be on Femgineer TV. Yeah, yes. I knew I was going to be on Femgineer TV. Yeah. Yes, and I'm also on a growth edge with my own project. Sure. I'm about to launch something big. It's sure. an inflection point in my own business. So, of course, the inner critic is going to be very close by. Okay. And yeah. so you decided to take a moment for yourself. Yeah, and I also meditated, and that helped a lot. Okay, mm-hmm. wonderful. Now, let's um, let's dive in a little bit deeper because even if we are good at managing our own self-criticism, mm-hmm. there are those wonderful folks out there that we work with on a daily basis, right? And unbeknownst to them, because they want to improve, right? We're all innovators here. We want to improve products. We want to improve services. Mm -hmm. So we're always giving each other feedback. And sometimes that feedback Mm -hmm. is perceived as a criticism. How do we manage those critical moments where we say, hey, take a look at this piece of code or this design that I've done or, you know, whatever it is that you've created. And how do you have the courage or how do you manage that process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love this question. It's really about filtering feedback Mm -hmm. and knowing how to do that. And I think women have more trouble with this. Okay. We are more empathetic Mm -hmm. and also emotionally empathetic. We can read facial expressions 
more easily Mm -hmm. and body language more easily. And what that creates is a type of sensitivity to how other people respond to us. Okay. So it's important to learn how to filter feedback. Mm -hmm. And I would say there are three things you have to ask yourself when you are confronted with someone else's criticism or feedback. The first is, is this person close to me? Mm -hmm. Um, Is just one layer or consideration. For example, if I get feedback from an internet troll. Yes. <laughs> which happens. those people. Yeah. <laughs> Shall I, should I filter that out or keep it in? Probably filter it out. Mm-hmm. This person has nothing to do with my life. Right. Right. The second question is, is this person experienced in the area mm-hmm. that they're giving me feedback in? Right. So let's say I start a business mm-hmm. and my dad calls me up. I make a business decision and my dad calls me up and says, you made the wrong decision. That's not the right decision. But my dad's a doctor. He's never even ran a business, yes. right? So I might have to say, okay, he is close to me. Right. I care about his opinion, but he has no experience in the area, right? So I have to filter that out as well. Uh huh. Yeah. And then the third question I would say is, does this person is this person a fan or a user of what you're building or creating? Okay. So. For example, let's say you start an online course. Yeah. Yeah. And you get an email from a close friend and they're like, um, you know, I've taken courses like this before. So they have, they're close. Yeah. They have the experience. Right. Yep. But I think you should do this. And why don't you do that? Surely you've gotten feedback. Oh, you've been reading my emails. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Right. So um, at that point, you have to ask yourself, is this friend my target audience? Right. 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 And often they're not. Mm -hmm. And so this is really helpful for me because I have really experienced, talented, close people in my life who want to give me their opinion about how I'm running my business and what what my branding decisions are. But the truth is they're not my target audience. So they really don't know. Mm -hmm. So that's another way to filter out. Mm -hmm. So I think those three questions help with filtering out. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. And then once we do the filtering, then how do we process the feedback? Mm-hmm. Like, let's assume they've passed all the checks. Okay, great. You know, yes, you are an expert. You're close. Like, we're coworkers. Mm-hmm. You know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. But in the moment, it still kind of stings, right? Especially if someone says, oh, look, you made a, a bug here or your design's not quite pixel perfect or, mm-hmm. you know, the way that you did that presentation, eh, you had a lot of ums in it, right? Mm-hmm. How do you manage that? Mm-hmm. I think, you know, if it stings, that's, you know, you got to feel that sting. <laughs> good. Okay, good. So there, yeah. so yeah. sit with it and yeah. be okay with sitting with it. Yeah, I think you got to feel the sting. I think the other is you, you got to create some space between you and what you're creating. So this is the artist dilemma, right? Okay, yeah, let's talk about that. We just get so attached to what we create and we're, this is our baby and it's so precious and it's an expression of who I am. Mm-hmm. It's, who, it's my soul, right? Yeah. And so there's this intense attachment. And so I think creating space, so being able to start to depersonalize yourself from your creative work Mm -hmm. and see that in some ways you are worthy, right? right, um, no matter what, and it's not attached to the creative work is helpful. Mm -hmm. This is why I like design and design thinking, because when you think like a designer, right, Right. you're able to say, hey, this is a, a design process. This has nothing to do with me. Yes. You know, this is just... This target audience member right. isn't resonating, so there isn't resonance. I think that's a good framing, just to see it as maybe there's a lack of resonance here. Mm-hmm. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with them. It's we haven't found fit yet. Yep. So thinking of it in terms of fit, like product market fit, right, is maybe a more a, a way to start depersonalizing as well. Okay, and that probably also helps with rejection, right? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and one other yeah, yeah, thing ahead. about rejection yeah. is um, to think, you know, what helps me with rejection is actually thinking about conversion rates. Okay. Yeah, like, tell me more. When you think about what is the actual conversion rate for something, right. it's a very small percentage. Yes. Right? It's like, I don't know. One percent, sometimes 1%. less, sometimes like 0.1. Yeah. And yet we operate like <laughs> like our conversion rate should be 100%. Yes. Like, I just went up to this one person data point of one right. and they need to fully accept me and love my project. So there's something around going for breadth 
Mm -hmm. and allowing yourself this again thinking like a designer allowing yourself to uh, really open up Mm -hmm. and go for many you know get many people's opinions Mm -hmm. um, or um, put yourself out there in front of many multiple people and expect a low conversion rate right I think that helps frame rejection yeah you know instead of um feeling like, oh my God, 50, you know, 50% of people rejected me. That's so high, you know, and feeling bad about that thing. Actually, that's, you know, that's great. It's 50% great. of people I don't have to deal with anymore. Yeah. <laughs> or 50% of people I don't have to deal with anymore. Yeah. So I think, you know, as I know that you've felt this too as an entrepreneur, like you get rejected all the time, mm-hmm. you know, and only a portion of things move forward. Right. But that's, why you have to keep putting yourself out there Mm -hmm. and you have to go for breadth. Yeah, very good. And let's talk about the last and biggest fear of them all, the fear of failure, Mm -hmm. right? We do something, we try something, we put ourselves out there and not only do people reject it, but it might just not, like even 100%, Mm -hmm. like nobody accepts it, not even 1%, not even Mm 0.1%. How do we move past that? Mm-hmm. Or how do we even move past that thinking? Sometimes people don't even fail, but they have that fear mm-hmm. before they've done something, right? So yeah. a lot of times it's they do and they fail, but a lot of times it's like they haven't even st- stepped up to bat yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I also feel like not a lot of people have failed. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm just trying to think like, again, like you said, the fear of failure right. is more is bigger than the actual mm-hmm. experience of failure. So... Because a lot of people talk about the fear of failure, and I feel it's very conceptual. Mm -hmm. It's like in the realm of imagination, because a lot of people have not even gotten close to that. Sure. So there's there's a reframe that or a a questioning that I have, which is, well, let me ask you this: When people fail, what are they afraid of after that? What are they What are they afraid of after the? What are the consequences of failure for them? Mostly, it's ridicule, Mm -hmm. right? It's ridicule and the criticism again of their closest friends family Mm -hmm. there are some who are concerned about well if I fail I'm gonna lose my house Mm -hmm. right or I'm not gonna be able to put food on the table but that's a very small portion in our industry and Mm -hmm. sort of the way we are um, positioned like we have a lot of comforts so we don't have to worry about that as much Mm -hmm. but we do have to worry about ridicule right oh you know my startup didn't exit or Mm -hmm. I had to shut down or it got dead pulled or our product didn't take off or we had a huge churn rate of customers who left or someone bad mouthed us on Twitter right so it's it's mostly around ridicule yeah I agree so I think when you probe fear failure it goes back to what we talked about the trio right Mm -hmm fear of criticism, rejection, as a result of making mistakes. Mm -hmm. So I like to frame fear of failure as fear of making mistakes. I Mm -hmm. think it's a more practical kind of concrete way of thinking about it that is more immediate and people have more experience with in their Mm day-to-day, you know. In their day-to-day, they might not feel like they'll fail, but they'll feel like, okay, I made a few mistakes. Right. So it it just keeps it more concrete. Okay, so let's assume Mm -hmm. we're ready to face our fears Mm -hmm. and we want to move forward with a creative pursuit but we're not 100% confident yet. You know, we're kind of dipping our first toe in. Uh, Tell us about how we can go about practicing creative confidence. Mm -hmm. Well, let's define creative confidence. Creative confidence is a mindset. Okay. It's a way of being that comes from design thinking, Mm -hmm. which is allowing yourself to be experimental, make mistakes, letting go of perfectionism, right? Um, it's a way of testing. It's a mentality of let me test this to mm-hmm. see what happens. Right. It's also um, having a detachment from outcomes. So it's a it's a mindset that encompasses all of that is what I think of as creative confidence. For women specifically, I've outlined 10 blocks to creative confidence that you can journal around. It's mm-hmm. in a playbook that I have available on my website. Um, so I think the first way we deal with fear is being able to acknowledge and recognize that it's there. Mm -hmm. The second is to be able to pinpoint it in the body. So fear often exists and lives in the body. Uh, We don't think of it that way. We think it's like a mental construct. It is, but it's a, it's a mental construct that's tied with a physical, physical attribute as well. Sure. So it's oftentimes when we're able to notice our fear in the body, it can really help diminish, diminish its power. So an example is I was talking in our my group 
a coaching session, a woman, she was sharing about her inner critic. And she said, it reminded me of your example. She said, I was in a meeting and I'm a new designer. And I felt, who am I to share what I want to share right now? Right. And she said she felt that in her throat. And she went like this, felt it here, right? And so the fear was in her throat. And so when we can cultivate mindfulness and become aware of and pinpoint the sensation in the body, mm-hmm. it starts to diminish. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you on the fear and being able to pinpoint it in your body. In fact, one of the things that I do before I do a lot of public speaking is the power pose mm-hmm. by Amy Cuddy. And it's been it's been great. But of course I still get up on stage and sweat buckets and it's just like, okay, mm-hmm. fine, you know, this is what's gonna happen. But I think a lot of times, uh, despite people acknowledging it, there's still a concern around outcomes, right? Because we're still being compensated, we're still being given approval, and those lead to positive outcomes like the product shipping, getting a promotion, getting a salary increase, all these things. So how do we pursue our creative pursuits and put the outcomes in the back, in the background? Mm -hmm. That's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> How do we put the outcomes in the big background? Yeah. Or, you know, we know that they're there, mm-hmm. but we don't want to fixate on them, mm-hmm. right? Because, again, it's going to hold us back. Again, I think people don't even get to that level where okay. they realize they're being attached to outcomes. Yeah. Right? It's like, um, I'm, I think there's a, a step before that, which is, Oh, I'm getting attached here. I'm okay. obsessed with this outcome. Sure. Right? And I really want it to happen. And I'm sure. gripping it tightly. Mm-hmm. And that's creating this, you might call it feverishness. Or okay. this anxiety or this um, fear mm-hmm. to come up. So I think the, the first thing is just acknowledging that there's attachment to outcomes. Mm-hmm. You know, um, Once that is acknowledged, I think the power of it goes down deeply. Um and I think there is a way to engage with that attachment. Okay. Some some ways that I have found extremely helpful yeah. have been, or I'm going to keep coming back to this, mindfulness, and yes. meditation. Okay. Right? But also journaling and externalizing. So being able to write down what are the outcomes that you feel attached to, mm-hmm. and to be able to, again, name them, look at them, and externalize them mm-hmm. reduces their power. There's a theme here, which is anything that you keep inside is going to grow. Anything right. that you're able to release yep. is going to, right, is yep. going to go down. So I think externalizing is key. And do you recommend we also do this with partners, like our managers, bosses, teammates? Mm-hmm. Is that helpful at all to do? Yeah, I think if there's trust in that relationship, you okay. can. It's nice to have an objective um person who can mirror things for you, Mm -hmm. like a coach or a mentor Mm -hmm. or a guide. Um, I think someone who doesn't have a bias Mm -hmm. or is not attached to whatever outcomes you are expressing. Right. So maybe not a boss. Yeah. (laughs) Because they'll they'll also may have their own agenda, right? Sure. So having some an agendaless person who can mirror something back to you like a coach is helpful. Yeah, yeah, I think that's great that you mentioned that because they can be your safe haven. You can bounce ideas off of them mm-hmm. without without the fear of, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, they're going to judge me or they're going to use this in a performance review or something like that. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. fair enough. So I know there's a lot of people who harness their creative confidence. They move forward. They pursue the creative pursuit. And then when it comes to promoting their work, they all of a sudden clamp up, mm-hmm. right? They don't want to share it. And they're afraid because they think promoting themselves is like sleazy or slimy and they would rather just not share it. Mm -hmm. How do you help them get over that hump? Mm -hmm. Well, I think what you brought up in the question is there's fear, Mm -hmm. then there's clamping up. Yes. Right? So this could happen in many scenarios. For example, you're about to go on stage, like you mentioned a few examples ago, right? Yeah. You felt fear, but in your case, you felt fear. But you didn't clamp up. Right. You went on stage and you gave the speech. What What was different for you? I've done it so many times, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And I know what the worst case is. I know worst case, someone's going to boo me and then I'm just going to keep talking anyways because mm-hmm. they're not my ideal audience or mm-hmm. they're having a bad day or 
there may be a friend just being funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, So you thought of the worst case, you accepted the worst case, Mm -hmm. right? Would you say that you felt fear? You did. Every time I go up there. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? (laughs) Every time you go up, you feel fear, right? So this is the difference between creative confident people, people who have creative confidence and people who don't. Okay. Both feel fear, Mm -hmm. but one doesn't clamp up and the other does. I see. One clamps up in the face of fear Mm -hmm. and one doesn't, right? Right. One stays open in the face of fear. So that's the key difference. Yes. Right? Clamping up versus staying open. Mm -hmm. And most people think, this is where people make the error, because I feel fear, I shouldn't do this, Mm -hmm. right? Right. Because I feel fear, I shouldn't self-promote myself. Because I feel fear, I shouldn't go up on stage. Because I feel this thing in my throat, I shouldn't speak up at the meeting, Mm -hmm. right? Right. But the example you just gave, how do you deal with it? You say, I'm feeling fear, I'm going to go do this anyways. Right. right? I'm going to continue to go. I mean, there are some amazing stories, anecdotes. Top performers who've been performing for 40 years, Mm -hmm. before they go on stage, they still vomit. (laughs) Yeah. And then they go on stage and they right. still do it, right? Right. So I think, again, is being able to be mindful mm-hmm. and acknowledge fear is there. It's normal. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean I'm doing something wrong. Right. And stay open. Stay open. And again, it's complicated. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain it the best that I can. But everybody is case by case. Yes. So every, every individual has their reasons for why they clamp. Right. And so finding out what yours are, yeah. oftentimes it's conditioning. Conditioning that you have to undo. It's a lot of work. Mm-hmm. Conditioning that you do with work through different practices, working with different people mm-hmm. um, can help you undo that conditioning so that you can stay open in the face of fear. So let's come back, though, to the specific of the self-promotion because this happens yeah. a lot in people who are extremely creative and are afraid to speak about their work. Mm. So how would you tell our audience, our viewers out there who are concerned about this? Like they create, they have the confidence to build, Mm. but then when it comes to showcasing, there is that next step. Yeah. I think, and this is very common for women, actually, the the hesitation to self-promote. Right. And I would say reframing self-promotion. Okay as storytelling. Okay. This has been very helpful to me. How can I tell an authentic story about who I am and where I'm coming from? This is one way. The other is, how can I tell a story? Let's say you don't want to share by yourself because you're like, that's too vulnerable and I'm afraid afraid to do that. You can also share a story of somebody else, right? A user that used your product, Mm -hmm. a client that's gone through your service, Mm -hmm. a reader who read your book, a friend that you gave advice to, Tell the story of that person, right? And Mm -hmm. that's, for me, storytelling is authentic marketing. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can come back and think of reframe marketing and self-promotion as storytelling, it becomes harmless, right? Like, who doesn't want to tell and hear stories? Sure. (laughs) It's great. And I think we've been doing that for thousands of years. It's the way that we humans find resonance Mm -hmm. with each other. So last question for you, for our viewers out there who want to get started and have a creative confidence practice, what would you recommend they do to get started? Mm -hmm. The first step is to be aware of what's blocking you. Mm -hmm. So be aware of your blocks. I have a creative confidence playbook. It's free. Okay, great. It's on my website. Yeah, we'll make sure to include it in the show notes. Yeah, it's my URL, mariamolfino.com slash free dash playbook. Okay. And... That will basically walk you through what I see are the 10 blocks that we've been conditioned to have and form Mm -hmm. and journal around each of them. I actually go through this playbook often. Like I, I, you know, I created it and I still use it. Good. You're dog fooding your own. (laughs) Yeah. I'm drinking my own medicine um, all the time because I'm constantly playing at my, or hoping to be playing at that edge. Right. Um, Which is a good sign. When I'm noticing fear come up, I'm like, oh, this is great. In fact, if I would say if you don't feel fear or fear isn't coming up for you, you might not be playing at your edge. Okay. You might be playing a little too safe mm-hmm. and be a little too playing a little too small. Right. So what go, you know, it's good to feel that. It's good to you and and, and I think looking at the blocks again and again and being in relationship to them has helped me okay, normalize and neutralize. <laughs> the fear okay normalize it's normal we all have it right neutralize 
allow it to not have so much power over my actions. Very nice. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Maria, for joining us today. I've learned a lot, and I know our viewers are going to get a lot of value out of this episode. Thank you. This was great. It was yeah. a lot of fun. Thank you. And thanks for tuning in today. And special thanks to our sponsor, Pivotal Tracker, for their help in producing this episode of Femgineer TV. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please share it with your friends, your teammates, and your boss. And subscribe to Femgineer's YouTube channel to receive the next episode of Femgineer TV. Ciao for now. This episode of Femgineer TV is brought to you by Pivotal Tracker. Build better software faster. Hi, Pornima Vijay Shankar here, founder. Hi, Pornima Vijay Shankar. I can't say my own name right. <laughs> While it's easy for us to feel, Ugh, I can't get the words up. Well, and welcome to From Junior TV and our special <laughs> guests today. <laughs> yeah, we didn't acknowledge the planet, Fortima. <laughs> <laughs>